If you're listening to Psych with Mike because you believe in the quality psychology information that you hear on this program, then do things to help us out. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Psych with Mike channel. Go to Twitter and subscribe to at Psych with Mike. Go to Facebook and also now go to TikTok at Psych with Mike. So go ahead and subscribe to all of those different ways of being able to stay connected to the show. But most importantly, go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a comment. That is really, really beneficial. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Welcome to the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan. I'm here with my gifted co-host, Mr. Brett. And I feel blessed and gifted to be here. (laughs) We just had, we just did 30 minutes yeah. uh, off mic talking about our own children. <laughs> yes, because God knows our children would have to be gifted. Yeah, yeah. there's no other option. Um, if they wanted to survive. Uh, well, or just compete for scraps, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe in your house. Not yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know... Uh, so just for sake of disclosure, I think that, well, three of our four okay. children are extremely high functioning. I think your son, your older son, is a very high, is a very intelligent man who sometimes can't get out of his own way. Is that fair? Uh, you'd have to ask him. <laughs> you, <laughs> you dirty dog. <laughs> uh, but uh, have you? did you ever think of any of your children as gifted? Yes. And why did you do that? What, what what made you think, oh, this child is gifted? I observed them in their natural habitat on a daily basis for many years. Mm-hmm. And I saw how they processed, how they handled things, how they problem solved, uh, how they made contact with others or didn't, mm-hmm. uh, and how they would compensate when things didn't go their way. And, and then we would discuss those things and co-parent them. My wife uh, was an elementary school teacher and very well informed on this topic, uh, these topics. And we, she and I, were both committed to making our children strong and Mm -hmm. capable and responsive and self-aware. So uh, when the school came to my wife and I and and said, you know, we think your children might be gifted, uh, I had a hard time believing that. Uh, okay, I don't know why you would have. Because but. I don't think that, I mean, honestly, I don't think that I believed that I was capable of producing gifted offspring. I think that was the, the thing, is that I, yeah. it was my own insecurity. I, I, mean, I, I know that. Have you read Hillbilly Elegy? Uh-uh. Oh, you need to read it. Do I? You need to read it. Absolutely you it, do. Is it a... Don't that, watch the movie. The movie's not very good. But the, the Hillbilly Elegy? Elegy. Hillbilly Elegy. It's about this... Uh, Young boy in Kentucky, uh-huh. in the backwoods And there Kentucky. is a movie also. There is a movie, okay. but it's not very okay. very good compared to the book. I mean, it's other things going for it. I am making a note uh, right now. My wife read it on vacation last year, and she kept saying to me, oh, my God, this is you. This is you. You, you could have written this book. You lived this book. Mm. Uh, but it's about growing up in a, in a redneck, uneducated, quasi-employed family mm-hmm. with issues. Mm-hmm. And how to survive mm. and how you try to get out of that and break the cycle so that you're not another generation we, of the same. We both might have some sense connection of to that. To yeah, that. absolutely. <laughs> to so, that. so she kept saying that to me, and I value her opinion. So I read it. It's yeah. a quick read. I absolutely agree with her. And, and I think you would benefit from reading it as well. And, uh, but, okay, but so if I had some difficulty believing that my children were gifted because I was insecure about myself. Yeah. You didn't have that. What What do you think allowed you? I have more ego than I can, I have room for. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I, I mean, a lot of times people can have ego and it's a cover. Uh, I, so I don't know. I mean, if you, if that's true, then whatever ego you're talking about had to be a healthy ego, not a, not a malignant ego. Right. Because so we, we if we talk about the difference of that, so you can have a malignant ego, which is a false bravado. It, it is a, a I, th- I think you'd have to ask my keepers. I'm not an objective distract. interpreter of that reality. Yeah. 
No, but but I'm saying, but if you were able to hear people saying, or you were able to observe your children and say, I think these kids might be gifted, then I think that whatever ego allowed you to see that and believe that had to be healthy. It wasn't malignant. My, but, but it wasn't about an extension of me. It wasn't about oh, this yeah, is my yeah, child, yeah. so it's got to be really brilliant. Mm-hmm. It was about objectively looking at this child's capacity to I function. See. Yeah, and I was I had a harder time with that, seeing them as not some kind of an extension of me. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I had a voice in my ear. Your wife? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so both of us, um, you have even more experience in this than I do because you were a an education professional for I was a, a high school teacher career. for 20 years, yeah. and then I taught university for another 25 years. Right. So I've taught at university, and in the group practice that we worked in together, mm-hmm. we did a lot of, provided a lot of support for schools. a lot of schools. Yeah. Um, and so we both have a lot of experience in this, in, in addition to teaching developmental psychology for millions of years between the two of us. Uh, so my issue, so we wanted to talk about this idea of giftedness because, and I'm going to say this, this is me, this is Michael. Uh, I have um, an aversion to the idea of giftedness as a whole well, for a that, number of reasons. So then you would probably embrace the concept of multiple intelligences. Absolutely. As, as opposed to a single IQ score. Absolutely. Uh, being definitive because there are areas that gifted children excel in and then areas where they're like normal that's children. That's right. And that's what you have to understand. How do we find your gifted areas and harness them to good outcomes for you and for others? Uh, and how do we help you live a normal life? Well, and why is it that the aspects of intellect that can be measured by an IQ test are the ones that we're, those are the only ones that we're responding to? Because if you take a Harvard professor and a homeless person and drop them both into the middle of New York City with absolutely no resources, the Harvard professor is going to die. And the homeless person is going to thrive. That is a different form of intelligence, but it is just as valid as any, and I can't measure that on an IQ test, Right. but it's just as valid as any form of intelligence that I can measure on an IQ test, but we never, ever, ever give that any credence. Well, more of us do now because of the the growth in uh, proponents or adherence to the theory of multiple intelligences. The idea that you have, like for instance, I have no spatial uh, capacity. Mm-hmm. I spatial S P A T I A L. Yeah. Uh, I can't look at a soma cube mm-hmm. and put it together in a pattern. I can't work a puzzle, a three dimensional p- puzzle, of thousand pieces. I can't see the connections. I mm-hmm. just can't see it. Mm-hmm. But I know people who can. Uh, I have some good friends that laugh at me because when we get together periodically they always suggest we should play blockus which is a board game with mm-hmm. little multi-shaped uh pieces that you have to try to build a design and mm-hmm. keep other people out of your design and move you know how do you block how do you gain progress whatever and they laugh at me because i get so frustrated because i can't see it i mean i literally cannot see it is that your son the engineer that likes playing that game no, that's uh, oh. his pediatrician, uh, oh. Dr. Norton and her husband, Michael. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, her, and their daughter, uh, Corey, mm-hmm. they laugh at me all the time mm-hmm. because th- they enjoy finding places where I'm not competent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, but uh, do you believe that because you're closer to education, your wife, not only did you teach for a long time your wife also taught and retired from teaching so do you believe that in gifted programs that we recognize the idea of multiple intelligences because i don't see my experience has not been that the educational uh establishment knows what they're doing with that Mm -hmm. and partly because there are political agendas Mm -hmm. there are economic issues involved there's classroom management garbage that you have to be concerned about, you know, teacher-pupil ratio, uh, so many other elements of raising and educating a child than just how do I spark the growth mm-hmm. in this one piece of his intellect. So I need to find lessons that, as a, as a teacher, one of the things that you are taught, you're going to, like in a high school, mm-hmm. I had 40 kids in, a, in an American history class. I had them for 50 minutes. Mm-hmm. 
I had to come up with a lecture or a lesson plan that would keep 75% of them busy for 45 or more minutes. Mm -hmm. So how do you find a lesson plan that's going to do that with 40 different kids? Mm -hmm. You know, some of them are going to fall asleep. Some of them are going to get out of a library book and read it. Some right. of them are going to do the work and, and get frustrated and quit because they can't do it. I mean, mm -hmm. you've you got a whole range of responses. Mm -hmm. So then you have the socioeconomic dynamics and the political dynamics and the dating dynamics and the hormone dynamics. You have all these things going on in a typical classroom. Mm -hmm. So if in your typical classroom you have one or two gifted kids, uh, they're as as likely, if not more likely, to be the kids that are acting out mm -hmm. because they get frustrated, they mm -hmm. get bored, they mm -hmm. they need to to just have some kind of stimulus that they can react to, so they create it, so they mm -hmm. poke somebody with a pencil, or they make little noises. I mean, you get autistic kids that do that, but you also get gifted kids, mm -hmm. and you get autistic kids that are gifted in some areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a real. So the educational system tries to find ways to test and identify these kids, and then put them in little special groupings where you pull them out of their normal classroom for an hour a day or two hours a week and put them in a different environment where they're more challenged. But your average teacher has to contain all these kids for more hours than that and do things with them that hopefully will stimulate them and teach them how to handle their frustration, mm -hmm. how to plot their own growth pattern, how to focus on things that they're interested in, but be able to come up out of it. You know, like if you're playing video games, you know, you watch these kids get immersed in video games and you try to cut them off, they will have a meltdown because mm -hmm. they, they can't pull out. They mm -hmm. can't disengage. But in life, you have to learn how to do that. Right. So you have, you, you're teaching more than American history or music or third grade art. You're teaching life skills. And you have to do that mm -hmm. wherever they are intellectually with a cluster of kids from disparate backgrounds. But so the, gifted the, classes... Uh, I embrace the idea. I just don't think they do as good a job with it as, okay. as I would hope. So so the idea of multi-intelligence is, is one reason why I'm against the idea of giftedness. The second reason that I'm against it is because, uh, so Rudolf Dreikers, who was an existential psychologist but did a lot of uh, seminal work in education, sending the foundation for how education classes are set up back in the 1960s, but more importantly, Lev Vygotsky, who was a... Russian psychologist, um, and he did a lot of work on trying to create uh, a more level playing field. And what Lev Vygotsky always talked about were these things called zones of proximal development, ZPDs. And the zone of proximal development is the level at which the difference between the level at which an individual can grasp a concept on their own and the level at which they can grasp it with assistance. Right. And so if you can teach yourself anything, if you're an autodidact and you can teach yourself, your zone of proximal development is a flat line. But for most of us, there's a difference. There's a difference between our ability to grasp a concept and our ability to grasp it with help. And what Lev Vygotsky said is that you should invest the most economic resources in the individuals that have the broadest zone of proximal development. Because the people who are at the top of the range, they're going to be okay. They're going to go to college. Most and teachers will tell you that. They're yeah. going to work it out Those and they're going to be okay. get it in spite of your right. inadequacies as a teacher or as right. a system. Right. But the kids who can't get it, yeah. those are the kids that are going to fall through the cracks. But then that operates under the premise that educators, mm -hmm. educational systems, are primarily focused on what's in the best interest of the child. Right. But they, it, it's the way our schools are funded, right. the way our schools are organized, the right. way our schools are administered. You know, parents of uh, somebody who's, whose father is the mayor, who's a wealthy businessman in my third grade class, is going to come in and expect certain attentions and uh, things to be provided for his child that may not have the same investment in another child getting. Mm -hmm. uh, and the school system has to balance that as best they can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, <laughs> if you are economically able to do it, you look around at the school districts in your area and see which ones seem to do the best job of that. And try to get your kid into those. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, they might get left behind. Okay, let's take a break and we will come back and we'll pick this up on the other side. Be back in a minute. All right. Hey, Brett, if you were going to tell somebody to check out something on the internet to help them with their mental health, what would you tell them? I'd tell them, listen to Psych with Mike. Why would you tell them that? 
because it's probably one of the most easily listenable experiences you can have that will give you information that's useful for a whole spectrum of concerns that people have. I agree and I have actually been told that by at least a dozen people, several of whom were not married to me and some of them didn't even know me. That's amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> it's when, when we get that kind of uh, feedback from people, it is so incredibly humbling and overwhelming for me. It is for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. So we really appreciate it. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psychic Friday. Okay, we're back. And uh, over the break, uh, I was kind of making fun of myself. About. I, I am certainly no, no gifted individual. <laughs> well, you're very gifted at making fun of yourself. I am gifted at self-deprecating humor. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So you then agree with me philosophically about this idea of investing resources in the individuals who are struggling the most. But you recognize that we don't actually do that. We is don't that, organize. Is that true? Well, I would postulate that okay. we don't run our schools according to our best understanding of best educational practices. Exactly. Period. And I've said that forever. And one of the reasons is because, uh, so uh, Noam Chomsky, who is a linguist, studied linguistics, call, uh, he came up with this concept of what's called a language acquisition device, LAD. And he said that the language acquisition device opens at, the, at birth and it closes at around 12 or 13 years old. And did you know that all babies, regardless of culture, all babble in the same language? Baby babbling is universal. That's that's a true fact. No, it is. It is. So I'm, so I'm smiling because it babies means... make all the noises that are inherent in every. So the phonemes that are inherent, the yeah. smallest parts of of language. There are like 29 different phonemes that we're capable of yes. hearing and and articulating. And babies but make all of them, age, and they drop out as you get out. as exactly. as the phonemes that are Which in your is language. Which easier get to learn foreign languages when you're two, when three, you're four, young. Yes. Than when you're 12, 15, right. 20. But we don't introduce language until middle school. We don't introduce in this country. We don't in this community. In this country. I think in some areas they do. Well, and, and if you go to an immersive school, then they may. But in every other country on the face of the planet, they introduce multiple languages from birth. And those children are multilingual, which is a sign of intelligence. So foreigners are more smart than our kids. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm saying in that domain. That I'm saying that we don't follow the yeah. precepts right. that we know are good educational concepts. Well, that's because we believe as a culture, we talk about all the time, that parents should have control over what their children are exposed to, what they are taught, what they learn, no matter what the, the subject matter might be, whether it's religion, uh, politics, uh, sexual theory, uh, behavior, uh, library, library books, mm -hmm. you know, it just... Uh, what was uh, the movie Footloose? Yeah, with Kevin Bacon, mm -hmm. where they had the local preacher. Yeah, John of Lithgow the, of the uh, Fundamentalist Church, mm -hmm. and the parishioners were going to the library and taking out books and burning them in a in a barrel mm -hmm. because they didn't want their children exposed to that filth. And uh, it was a big, big issue in, in the movie. Mm -hmm. yeah, what do we do about this if mm -hmm. we disagree that our public schools offer these things for other children? Right. But we don't want our kids right. exposed to them. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a movement in the evangelical community to completely uh, disavow the teaching of evolution in elementary school. Well, not only movement, there are laws that are passed in different states yeah. where you can't do it. Yeah. So, or if you do it, if you try to do it, you also have to uh, teach the biblical version. Right. A parallel. Right. Like that's the only other version of creationism that exists in... Inherit the wind. Yeah. So, uh, and, and we're kind of going a little bit off, <laughs> off track. But, we're propagandizing. But uh, do you... All right, so let me start a different way. I believe that our educational system would be stronger that it would be better, that it would serve the needs of the public much more effectively and efficiently 
if we adopted a more Lev Vygotsky style and actually tried to invest the most resources in the children that are struggling the greatest. Do you agree with that premise? Intellectually, yes. Okay. Realistically, I right. don't know how right, you right. could do it. I, I mean, I, um, there are too many political agendas mm -hmm. that have to be attended to in a public school system or even a private school system uh, for how they get run, who gets employed, mm -hmm. what they teach, how kids are handled in terms of discipline, what lessons they are exposed to. It's, it's about politics more than a pure concept of education. Which leads me to my second point, which is that the idea of giftedness yeah. in our education system has absolutely nothing to do with the children and everything to do with the idea that the parents are living vicariously through the accomplishments of those children. Yeah. Yeah. And you would agree with that? I would. Yeah. I've and seen, so, seen a lot of evidence. I, I got called in one time as an outside uh, consultant mm -hmm. for a conflict involving a local school district mm -hmm. and the parents of this child. Mm -hmm. The parents were quite politically active and, and established and somewhat wealthy, and they had connections. And when George W. Bush was elected president of the mm -hmm. United States, they were invited to D.C., to participate in the inauguration Ooh, la, la. and they took this child with them because it's a lifetime opportunity which mm -hmm. i absolutely agree with yeah, so, yeah. so does sure. the school district yeah. but the teacher uh, english teacher had assigned uh, a particular essay that had to be written and there was a deadline for when it had to be turned in mm -hmm. child didn't do it child went on vacation with his parents and saw the president and saw more important things and came home so i didn't do this and got an f a zero mm -hmm. and the parents were going to sue mm -hmm. because the child had an educational experience, why couldn't he write an essay about that? Mm -hmm. And so they brought me in to negotiate. But the, still outside the parameters of the due date. And the assignment. Yeah. And uh, so they weren't happy with my representation because I took the position of the school district. I mm -hmm. said, yeah, absolutely. Well, partially their position. You, you, your child should be able to write an essay about his trip to Washington and what he learned. It just and what shouldn't he saw. count for this assignment. Exactly. Yeah. He still has to jump through the same right. hoops that every other kid has yeah. to jump through. And and you know, and but this but, is... but the purest argument, like the one that you're making, would be, what's the best educational experience for that child? And that's where he should put his energy, and that's where we should put our money, and he should be able to to do that. Um, I don't know that that is. I I mean, I see how you would make that linkage. Yeah. That is not my intent. My intent is to say I would want to invest the resources in the individuals who have the broadest zone of proximal development, who need the most assistance. And what I would do is that I would take the gifted children and I would match them up. So the most gifted child would get matched up with the child who struggles the most. And I would make little pods uh, where these individuals could... That presumes that the gifted child is able to teach and explain what they know how to do. Right. Which, in which, my experience, no, 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 no. they're not able to. No, and, and, and you would have to, and, and, and they wouldn't be left alone to their own devices. I mean, you would still have a tremendous amount of supervision. As a matter of fact, you might, it might, you might need someone, maybe not the official teacher, but someone to look over those pods and actually work with them to make sure that they were on track. But the point being that it would give the child who is gifted some responsibility for helping and conveying their knowledge base, and it would help support the younger child. That's just one of my ideas. I know ideas. that argument. I just disagree with it. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, but but whatever my whatever the the structure of that is, I would invest the most resources into the individuals who are struggling the most, which would mean that instead of Ledoux is a well known school district in St. Louis, instead of Ledoux being the most uh, uh, f uh, financially uh, prestigious school district, I would give all of that money to the St. Louis City School District the public school district. I would invest the most resources in the kids who are struggling the most. And the idea of giftedness... So, but it's too complex a conversation. I mean, okay. if you look at the way schools are organized in America, um, how does an elementary school decide what's appropriate to teach and assess the learning capacity of the child and the need structure of the child when they also have to 
worry about the the child didn't have breakfast and the child isn't going to get lunch. Well, the child doesn't okay. have shoes. Yeah, yeah. And if this child goes home tonight in his apartment, he has to go in the bathroom and lay in the tub because bullets are going to be flying around. Mm-hmm. So how am I going to teach him algebra or geometry or American history in a comparative capacity right. to the child that goes home with maids and swimming pools right. and right. I mean you can't you can't no, argue no, you, that. You, you're you're, abs- you're absolutely 100% correct um, and just as anything uh, if you're going to actually make an executable plan it has to you have to strip out all of those nuanced but you can't. I, well, okay, but 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 we do even now. I mean, even now under the giftedness and under under the gifted programs that we run, we're still stripping out all of that stuff. No one's taking that into consideration. So, so again, depending on where you live and what the the nature of the populace seems to be, there are cases where uh, abusive parents are able to retain their parental rights mm-hmm. to have access to this child without supervision because they are biological parents Mm -hmm. and they don't play a functional role in the life of the child or productive role in the life of the child but they still by god have rights and they Mm -hmm. get to have that child and they can do things with and to that child that every responsible adult says oh my god but the court system allows it because they rarely strip parental rights from anybody for anything Mm -hmm. So then, as a school teacher, you get caught in that situation. Mm-hmm. I'm teaching fifth grade English or fifth grade school, and I have a child in my classroom whose parents are divorced, and the mother has a court order saying the dad can't come to school and pick the child up. I know. And the I've dad shows up with his lawyer and yeah. says, my kid, here, look at the biology. Give me my kid. Mm-hmm. And some schools let them go. Some mm-hmm. schools don't let them go. But why is that the school district's business? My job is to teach that child in the fifth grade. I agree 100%. So, and, and I mean, that wasn't the, where we were going to go in our conversation, right. but I just don't think you can make uh, broad stroke uh, conclusions about what the best method is. Well, but but we have system. to make but we have to make something because we have to have an an executable plan. So, so we, we have to do the best it, we can, it, yeah. right? And 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 we already have an executable plan that I think both of us have said that we may not completely agree with. Yeah. yeah. So then, but, if we're but gonna, like the high school in in Miami, where all those kids got shot. When your high school age kid has to worry about getting shot to death, going to school. Mm-hmm. If I have to worry about my kid being in school, I mean, parents give their kids cell phones now and say, you know, if there's a shooter, call me and I'll come and get you and you can sneak out of the building and blah, blah, blah. You know. And the schools are all busy saying, hey, hey we're going to have lockdown. We're going to stay here. It's going to be safe. I remember one time as a classroom teacher, we had a bomb threat mm-hmm. and they va- vacated the school and they asked all the adult male teachers to go through the school and open all the to lockers stand, looking for the bomb. Stand, stand as a, as a, as a human shield yeah. around no, the no. school we already, perimeter. We already got all the kids out. I know. We knew the kids were safe. I know. But because it's, they didn't really think it was a bomb, they right. said to the male teachers, you go in and look for the bomb. I said, I'm not going. I was going to say, but that's it. Just, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. That is just as ridiculous yeah. as me saying stand as a human shield around the perimeter. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it absolutely was ridiculous, and they were very distraught with me, but yeah. I didn't go. Yeah. But the coaches went, and the local police yeah, went. Yeah, because and, the coaches are all heroes. They're all heroes. Uh, they're nice guys. The ones that I knew, they were nice guys. I know, I know. But Better uh, them than me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and there was no bomb. There was no bomb. Yeah. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time talking about our dissatisfaction with the way the system runs, but the system runs the way the system runs. Yeah. And the truth is that there are some gifted children. Yeah. And they survive anyway, don't they? Yes. Uh, and they do have some challenges. And so oh, yeah. let's spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about what that is, because both of us have had some experience with gifted children, both through our exposure to the school system and also because of our own children being in that category so uh what would you say is the most important thing for a parent who has a gifted child to know i would say as a counselor a teacher and a parent the most important thing for the parent of a gifted child to know is how to help support and focus that child so that their uh, frustration is minimized and their uh, functioning capacity increases. They have to learn how 
to lose. Mm -hmm. They have to learn how to fail. They have to learn to self-stimulate and self-soothe. And my job as a parent in tandem with the school district is to support lessons and experiences that will teach them those things. Yeah. And we didn't have this conversation in advance, but that is exactly what I would say is the most important thing. I, the only difference I would say is that don't overlook the emotional side of your child because you're too focused on the intellectual side. No, absolutely not. Kids yeah. who are gifted a lot of times, we assume that they emotionally regulate perfectly because they're gifted. That's crazy. Oh, no, they almost never do. No, they have harder time with yeah, emotional I regulation because agree. of being gifted. And so we have to spend more time helping well, that the same individual. Thing, and my wife and I were having this conversation because I knew we were going to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, and I said, I, I had the same exact response to dealing with handicapped children. Mm. You know, parents that have a handicapped child have two roads in front of them. Um, both of them are horrible and rough. Mm -hmm. One is to say, oh my God, you're handicapped. We have to protect you from everything so you can't experience any pain, any loss, any, right. any reality. Which the child ends up resenting. But also not learning how to cope with life. Yeah. And and the other ones are the ones that approach the other road, which says, you got screwed. Life mm -hmm. gave you a rough road, but we're going to walk it together and you're going to learn how to do as much as mm -hmm. you can do so that you can live independently someday. Because mm -hmm. mom and I are going to be dead. And we've got to teach you how to survive. We can't guarantee that your little brother is going to take care of you or that the system is going to take care of you. What can you learn to do? What are you capable of doing, given your limitations, mm -hmm. whatever they might be? That's a much harder road because mm -hmm. they're going to cry. They're going to be frustrated. They're going but to... it's the one that, as an adult, yeah. they're going to respect more. Uh, I hope so. I mean, my my hope is that they, they would learn that way mm -hmm. how to survive on their own. Mm -hmm. And I'm not handicapped. To, to the degree that right. they could. Yeah. Right. But from what I understand, what I know of handicapped individuals, they don't want to be treated as porcelain dolls. They resent no. the implication of exactly. that, that they're not capable. So they want to be held responsible of for what they can realistically do. So we don't want to have unrealistic expectations but they do want to live in a world where they have the opportunity to do what they have the capacity to do did you ever watch the tv series the good wife i did not you did not uh there's an attorney who is physically handicapped mm. who has significant limitations uh played by alex keaton from mm. uh family ties mm -hmm. uh michael j fox michael j fox and uh, he deliberately, intelligently, purposefully uses all of his limitations as a way to sway a jury or a judge mm. on behalf of his clients, you know, to get extra time, to get mm -hmm. extra benefits, to get considerations that other attorneys would blow right past. And he does a beautiful job of showing that dynamic mm. of the really functional person with limitations mm -hmm. who's able to use their limitations as a tool mm -hmm. as well on behalf of whatever they're trying to achieve. It's kind of an interesting thing to watch. So I think that's a great out. Yeah. So, so hopefully this was beneficial for people. And uh, as always, if you have questions or comments, you can get us at psychwithmike.com. The music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And please uh, go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a comment. We would really appreciate that. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.